so good morning and uh, good evening everyone based on uh, where on the globe you are situated at this point of time um, my name is shishir kumar upadhyay and i am senior international advisor at lehigh university and i would like to uh, welcome you all to the first webinar of the our india specific webinar series and today's webinar is presented by our dean of college of education dr william godery and the topic is the sustainable development goal uh 2015 2030 in covid 19 era uh dr godely is the eighth dean of college of education at lehigh and i would like to invite dr godely to take the stage and uh, discuss the webinar thank you so much shashir um good morning everyone and good or good evening uh, whichever the case might be uh it's a pleasure to be with you and to share with you some thinking about how covid is affecting the sustainable development goals and i wanted to begin by talking about the goals in general and so i'm sure many of you have some background or knowledge about the sustainable development goals and then i want to shift into talking about them in relation to what's happened around the pandemic um and the ways in which the goals uh can support uh, a globally synthesized a uh, response to this as well as uh a local response where many of you i assume are in educational institutions in higher educational institutions and i think there's a great deal that can be done in this moment um to support the work ongoing around the helping professions whether it's in teaching or counseling or home based care or community organizations and so my focus today will be on first setting the stage for the goals and then following up with an analysis of how the goals might help us to uh, get through this this very challenging time um i want to encourage you to uh to raise questions to um ask um questions to make comments along the way um I'll be using the chat feature and so when you chat something in the box I'll be able to see it and then I'll try to stop and respond and or open that up for a larger conversation and we'll have a chance at the end of this to um have a larger conversation about the work that lies ahead and possible collaborations and partnerships uh, between you and Lehigh University we intend to have a very strong presence there as we already do um and we intend to make that even greater in a post covid era so let me just begin and say a bit about my own work um i was a uh, secondary classroom teacher for a decade and from there i went into the university for the past 20 years and um 30 years of of my life has been spent doing work around global education or what i would call now global citizenship education um a lot of that appears in publications um and two of them i would point you to um are my most recent books world class teaching and learning in global times and most recently global citizenship education everyday transcendence um and what i try to do in these works is to outline what are some of the challenges and what are some of the opportunities that exist with respect to teaching about the world and i think it's a useful um uh, starting point for the conversation and in those books i raise a lot of questions about what are the challenges associated with teaching about the world and if stacy can uh keep me honest here and um i'm asking getting a request to increase the sound uh see if i can do that I'm not sure that made any difference but um let me know if that if that didn't work. So, um for today's session, we're going to overview the sustainable development goals and I want to also give you some background on this concept of sustainable development. What does that mean exactly? And then we're going to talk about the economic conditions as a result of COVID. Um we're going to explore the negative consequences of COVID on education and I'd love to get your input on all of these as well because we're all living through this simultaneously. And then lastly talk about ways that we can mitigate um these challenges and also build resiliency for the future, right? So that's crucial. We have to think about how can we avoid the next pandemic with what we do in the intervening years after this pandemic has um diminished in its scale certainly it's not going away anytime soon but it's diminished in its scale i wanted to point you first to uh this histogram which is on uh the right hand side of the screen and i think this is a really useful way to think about the world economically and that's really the beginning point of the sustainable development goals they draw from the starting point that the world is vastly unequal 
that wealth is maldistributed on Earth. And as a result, there are very substantial development challenges for all people in all societies. And so I think this histogram um, or this graph represents that quite well. So you see uh, the countries of uh, Europe. Um, sorry, let me back up there. Uh, you see the countries of Europe, you see uh, North America, uh, you see the Asian countries, um, you see India is right here, um, and you see the relative proportion according to their gross domestic product. And so what that means is um, the area surface on the map here, so this that I'm gesturing to here is uh, equatorial Africa. Um, that is equivalent to the same piece of land that I'm gesturing to here, let's say in South Carolina off um, in the Southern United States, um, or let's say the West Coast of, of India, right? So there are chasmic differences in terms of wealth in the world. And as a result, there are significant development challenges. And so the goals are really oriented to address those challenges. I will say as a critique, what the goals do not do is they do not articulate a kind of history as to how we got to this point, right? So you are well aware of the presence of colonialism, right? And the presence of neo-colonialism in India. And these issues are not explicitly addressed in the goals. And I'm teaching a class now uh, with educators from around the world where we do a deep dive into the goals. And this is a challenge that many have brought up, which is the goals are ahistorical in that they don't examine the kind of history of how we got to the position that we're in, where so much of the wealth is in the North, the global North, and so little of the wealth of the world is distributed in the global South. And I think it's important to teach with them and organize with them with this in mind, um, because it's easy to get kids in looking at that map and say, well, why is that? And to not have an historical analysis is really to lack um, an ability to explain why things happened the way that they did, and then how do we figure out a path out of this? And certainly, as I said, uh, colonialism and neocolonialism had a lot to do with the maldistribution of wealth in the world. So I wanted to start with that because that is the starting point. The maldistribution of wealth on the planet is the starting point for the Sustainable Development Goals. So let me also begin orienting um, out of this world uh, with this uh, earth rise, this wonderful image from 50 years ago. And um, this is the first opportunity that the world had to see itself as a singular entity in 1968. And this plaque is laid um, in 1969. Um, and so this is a very significant moment in that um, it was the first time human beings were able to see themselves as a singular place, Earth, as well as a singular species. Um, certainly that idea was, was present before that time, um, but this is where it really became utterly clear that that's how we were in, in the world, in a sense, all together and as one. And I took a an image from the plaque that's on the moon. It reads, here men from the planet Earth first set foot foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. What I think is very interesting there is though it's signed by the President of the United States at the time, Richard Nixon, and though the mission was from the US, it's not written in that, fra in that phrasing. So it's written as from all of mankind. I think that's very significant because when we're far enough away from the earth, it's very easy to see us as singular. Um, and so there's something about the distance and the separation that allows us to enjoy and appreciate the singularity of our being. And I think in essence, that is what the SDGs are trying to do, which is they aspirationally point towards a world where we are singular, where we are one. Um, and we recognize that the planet's problems are our problems and they are shared across humanity. And part of the SDGs is to share them in a way that is more equitable. Right? That is more distributed in a way um, unlike the wealth on the planet. So I wanted to begin with that. Um, the SDGs takes a problematic view of the world. And what that means is that it recognizes things like climate change, equity and gender disparities, um, hunger, ethnic violence, terrorism, natural disasters. I put that in quotes because no disaster is really natural. It's that 
humans construct into areas that should not otherwise be built in and there create disasters. So with the exception of earthquakes and even those have some of that dimension to them, none of them are truly natural. They are human created. Um, tidal flooding, uh, political instability, and as we're witnessing right now, and we'll talk about later is infectious diseases. So there are a significant number of problems that the world faces. And yet we don't face those problems as a global community. We face them as independent sovereign actors, as states. Um, that's all well and good when they're regional. But when they cross boundaries, there is a need to address from a singular perspective in an aggregated way how we can address global problems. And in essence, that is what the Sustainable Development Goals is attempting to do. I wanted to talk about the issue of wealth in a little more historical perspective first. And that is, um, in 1990, uh, gross, this is the gross world product per capita by 1990 measures. And you'll notice that it has increased substantially, right? So if we look at the, uh, the current, which this is a little bit dated, but it gives you a sense of the J curve that occurred uh, in the period of industrialization. So there has been a massive creation of wealth on the planet um, and it is maldistributed. Um, and with that massive creation of wealth, um, the lack of sharing of that wealth has created a situation where it's very difficult to think of a world that can be more equitable. Um, and an attempt to do that is really to talk about poverty as a singular problem and as one that needs to be addressed by the world. It's not a country's problem. It's not a region's problem. It's a global problem. And there's a reason why no poverty is the first sustainable development goal. Because if we can achieve, if we can eradicate extreme poverty in the world, the lowest quintile, the people that are living on a dollar fifty U.S. proportional dollars per day, um, if we can do that, a lot of the other challenges will be significantly reduced. It won't be that they'll go away, but be significantly reduced. And so, no poverty is the first goal. Um, zero hunger is the second goal. Good health and well-being, which we're going to talk a lot about today because of COVID, is the third. And quality education, the fourth. We'll also spend some time on that because we're mostly educators. Um, the other goals, and, and these are in a sense prioritized. So I don't want you to think that the, the larger number ones are somehow less important. But the people who formulated this, this agenda believe that the first four are most significant. And the reason being is that those have the greatest impact on the other goals. So when you achieve these, you synthetically achieve the others as well, or you have uh, positive consequences in those other areas as well. So the others being number five, gender equality, six, clean water and sanitation, um, seven, affordable and clean energy, eight, decent work and economic growth, nine, uh, industrial innovation and infrastructure, uh, 10, reduced inequalities, 11, sustainable cities and communities, 12, responsible consumption and production, 13, 14, and 15, I like to call the bio goals. And I would say that's unfortunate they are ranked as low as they are, but this is in some ways a political choice, right? Because this was a document that 190 countries had to agree to, they did. Um, and they adopted it in September of 2015. That's significant in and of itself. And so 13 is climate change, 14 is life below the water, and 15 is life on land. 16 is very interesting, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. I've been talking about 16 a lot in my recent class, because as you probably know, we've had a lot of protests around the death of George Floyd. Um, and he's one of a litany of African Americans who suffered at the hands of law enforcement, um, suffered lost their lives at the hands of law enforcement. And there have been a lot of protests as a result. And we've been talking about 16 because it explicitly addressed the relationship between law enforcement and their communities and the way in which to have a stable and healthy relationship. So that's been of particular significance of late. And then lastly is 17, the partnership to achieve the goals. So there are these 17. You'll notice too that there's an empty box, which I like to call the, the 18th goal. So we can imagine a time in the future in the year 2028 where we're preparing the 2030 goals and there will be a lot of discussion about how to expand these. Originally, these were called the millennial development goals. There were eight of them. They only applied to the global south. Now they apply to all countries regardless of 
their economic wealth because these problems, even if it's a very wealthy society, have all of these same problems within them. So I like to call this the problem that Chandra Mahanti uses the phrase, the South within the North and the North within the South, right? So within any, within any very wealthy country, there's a great deal of poverty. With any, within a poor country, there's a great deal of wealth. And so wealth is not equally distributed by geography, um, and yet it is concentrated in parts of the world. So we begin with this as a kind of founding framing to this work. And um, goal 18, as I was saying, it's the unnamed goal. Um, it's what we imagine you know, the next set of goals might include. And a lot of this work um, that's carried out is carried out by non-governmental organizations, by community-based organizations, um, by others that try to study and, and the states that participate, 190 countries around the world, that participate in measuring with statistics the accomplishment of the benchmarks within each of these goals. So I'll say a bit about more about that in a moment, but again, this is just as background and uh, I'm sure some of you already know this and apologies if this is all rehearsal for you. So where does this all come from? And again, if you have questions or comments, please use the chat and I will, I will address those. Um, the idea of sustainable development is often associated with the environment and yet it means more than that. So in the Brundtland Report of 1987, Our Common Future, it was stated as development that meets the needs of the present generation without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And so this um, little box in the center um, represents of this Venn diagram, that equitable point where the economy grows so that more people who are previously left out are included, that's the equity phrase, uh, phase, um, while not destroying the environment. So it's the balance of economic growth, equitable distribution of resources, and care for the biosphere that is sort of that I would say sort of mythic place of sustainable development because it's really something that's aspirational that we are working towards as a global community. It's not something we've achieved. Um, what's interesting about the phrase is that people often hear sustainability and they think environment. They leave out the equity part. And to me, the equity part is actually the most important part because one of the uh, really negative hedges on the environment is the great inequity that exists where people with a lot of resources can act as they wish and use as much as they wish um, for their own benefit or for the benefit of you know, their immediate circle, um, as well as the desperately poor who don't have the provisions um, for access to clean and potable water um, and also lack the ability uh, to develop because of these, um, these barriers. So I really like to keep in mind that the economic and the equity part are just as important as the environmental part when we're talking about sustainability. And it's really about this notion of balancing uh, the development needs of the world um, with the idea of economic growth and equity being achieved within that balance. Um, and it's a tricky balance. It's not, it's not one that we have achieved, certainly. Um, and it's aspirational, really. It lies somewhere in the future. So as I said, there are 17 goals. Under each of these goals are measurable targets, 169 measurable targets. And I mentioned before that they grew out of the millennial development goals. Those goals were different in that they were only geared to countries in the lowest, um, lowest half of the, uh, I'm sorry, lowest quintile um, of the lowest fifth, rather, sorry, it's early in the morning, the lowest fifth of the global aggregate economy or economies. And this one applies to all countries because as I said, all countries have these problems. I wanted to share with you um, something that's really interesting on the dimension of the goals and get your feedback perhaps on this um, is a video. So hopefully this will come through. And if it doesn't, um, if one of the people who's helped me organize Stacy or Shashir, uh, please let me know and I will reshare the screen.
talk about gender equality that's a given right because you will make it happen girls can be pilots girls can be world leaders girls can be rock stars like chris martin let's continue to use our collective voice for social good we should all feel very proud of what you've achieved here tonight thank you Let me just uh, exit out of that so we don't get more of that. <laughs> okay. So are we, are you able to see the um, PowerPoint again? Let me try this one more time. It should be there. Okay, great. So, um, a couple of things about that concert. Uh, obviously, you know, it was held in, in Mumbai and uh, I, I was there so I can give you some like ground level perspective. Maybe some of you were there as well. Um, it was a huge event. I think there were some half a million people or more that attended, which maybe that's not such a huge event in the context of India, but there were a lot of people there. Um, it was um, my purpose for going was to try and understand what was the pedagogical value of these kinds of events. So what do they achieve in terms of educating a wide population about things like the sustainable development goals. And what was really interesting and please use the chat feature if you want to share a perspective about this, but it was attempting to kind of do mass education through a rock concert with Chris Martin and people like that to, um, to emphasize the importance of the goals. And when I was talking with people who were attending, uh, many of them didn't know much about why they were there other than for the concert, right, as you might expect. So there was some energy, certainly there was a lot of excitement um, and it was a, a really long and hot day. People were really crowded, but there was a sort of good energy in the crowd. But in terms of what people understood from what was there, they kept hearing about the need for potable water, 
the need to end public defecation, the need to uh, deal with sanitation issues, notice washing your hands if you could hear that part of it. So they were really gearing it towards, um, I would say, um, rural people, and yet it was urban people in many cases, people in, in Mumbai who were engaged in the festival. Um, I don't know if others want to share thoughts about it, but one of the pieces, and please do if you have questions or comments about this approach, but the approach behind the SDGs is to popularize them, right? So to use the media, to use spectacle, to use concerts like Jay-Z, you know, Chris Martin, um, high profile uh, entertainers to come in and advocate for them and to do that as a way of, of publicly educating a wider wider body of people than generally would be reached by schools or by universities. Um, one of the challenges of doing this is that you have a kind of mass education where there's a, there's a thin quality to what people know about the issues. So if they're relying solely on this festival as the basis of what they know. They probably don't know a whole lot about the challenges of development in the world. Um, so uh, it's, I think, an interesting example or strategy. And so you'll notice about the SDGs that there's a lot of uh, events around them, and not, not lately because, you know, obviously with COVID, um, there's a lot of events around them. There's an attempt to make them cool, right, or to make them hip, right, to appeal to a younger generation um, and to do it in such a way that is sort of in the trappings of music and entertainment and fun. Um, so it's a strategy, and you know I think it's it's a it's one that deserves some examination. Um, and I, I think I'll also share with you that there's uh, there was an intention in 2020 this year to have five simultaneous concerts happening in the world in September. So there's the one in Central Park in New York that's now long standing. They've had uh, the one in Mumbai. There's been one I think leaving was in Cologne, Germany. And so now there's an effort, they're gonna reach five cities at once and they're gonna simulcast you know, this concert around the world. Uh, last I read that's been postponed till 2021. So we'll see if it happens then. Um, but again, it's this idea of popularizing and using the media and using celebrities to um, emphasize the importance of the goals. And it's a particular educational strategy. Um, and you know, we could talk further about what do you think the value of that is. In terms of progress in the goals, um, I won't go through all this and I'll share the slides with Shashir so he can pass them on to you. Um, but obviously, I think the most significant progress has been with respect to the falling population of extreme poverty. So again, these are the people that are living on roughly $1.50 uh, proportionally per day in US dollars, uh, which of course in the communities where they live is greater spending power than $1.50 would be, let's say, where I live. but or where you live, but it still is not a great deal of money, right? This is extreme poverty. People living on $600 or so, $550 a year. Um, that number's decreased um, substantially. Uh, and so it's now down uh, to some 836 million. Uh, so progress has been achieved. Now, some would say, and I think arguably this is right, that, well, that's been achieved because India largely and China largely have grown economically, irrespective of the goals, had nothing to do with the goals. They were in a period, uh, are in a period of substantial economic growth. And so that has distributed more money within those societies where there's huge populations that literally move the planet in terms of these aggregate numbers. And that would be absolutely true. Um, so we say the goals created this expansion of wealth, not really. It was the countries that created the expansion of wealth and then the goals picked up in measuring that. But that being said, there's been substantial progress in eradicating that lowest quintile, um, the most extreme poverty. Um, you'll also notice that the number of out of school children um, has fallen by almost half. Um, and so that's a substantial achievement from 2000 to 2015. Um, now, whether that would have happened without the goals, again, that's kind of the the, the big question, I think probably a lot of it would have been achieved, um, but the goals help to create a kind of energy and a consolidated effort, both symbolizing and actually achieving some of the work that we believe is important, such as expansion of education. So I'll let you read through these as you'd like, um, but 
you know, I think that they, they capture some of the progress. And a lot of this is aggregating statistical data. Now, here's another challenge, which is if, it's a, if a country is struggling with development needs, such as sanitation, access to nutrition, access to education, then they're very unlikely to be able to measure that data accurately. Right? So some of the data itself is suspect or it's drawn from state data that may either fudge the data or create the data or guess the data um, or use weak inter intermediary measures to evaluate the extent to which this has happened. So I think that's a, an inherent weakness within this um, exercise of measuring data. Um, and then lastly, I'll show this same chart in terms of um, the amount of people who are not living in extreme poverty, you'll see that this end of the funnel in a sense grows by 2015. Um, so the number of people living in extreme poverty has substantially decreased. Again, the growth of India and China's economies, uh, as well as other countries, has contributed significantly to that. Um, and therefore, the number of people living in extreme poverty has diminished. Let's talk now exclusively about COVID and its impacts. Um, so for the, for the remainder of our time. So um, I want to focus on the first four primarily because the first four are, I would say, the chief development goals within the goals. It's not to mean the others are unimportant. They're all important. But these are the four where if you're going to really move the needle in terms of eradicating poverty, then you've got to name no poverty as goal one um, because that's a very significant order by the year 2030. Um, so we'll look at these individually, and I want to end with quality education because, A, it's really elemental to any developmental growth within a society. Um, and of course, as educators, it's something that we all share. Um, so I want to talk about these um, in some more detail. So some of the headlines, I know you've been reading them, but we're looking at a very bad economic situation. It's certainly the, the world is in a global recession. I don't know if it's officially been declared as such. I know there's been um, a recession declared in the United States as of yesterday, starting in late February. And recession means, in technical terms, uh, two quarters of negative gross domestic product growth or negative growth. And so two quarters of negative growth means the economy's in recession. And I'm not sure that there is an uh, an official definition of depression, um, but it's a long-term uh, loss of economic growth um, that's often coupled with um, a decline in uh, value of, of goods. So this is the kind of situation that we may be in. We're not sure. It's sort of we're in the middle of it. Um, the, there is forecasted for the first time. Um, in a long, long time, largely due to India and China, but in a long time, uh, forecasted negative global economic growth as a result of coronavirus. And so, well, who is that affecting? Probably you're aware of this, as we are, that it affects most directly the most vulnerable populations. So the poorest people get poorer, and the people that are middle income and above often can achieve some degree of stability, although you know they have negative hits in a condition like this, but they're generally safer um, economically and they can protect themselves. Um, and that's not the case for the most vulnerable. And certainly that has been the case uh, in the United States. It's the hourly employee in our case. Um, it's the uh, waiter or the waitress in a restaurant uh, it's the piecemeal employee, it's the consultant, it's the, these people that have lost their jobs. Um, as a university professor, I've not lost my position, right? And so there's a class dimension into um, the economic downturn and who suffers greatly as a result of that. Um, we're looking at 80% of the world's workers have been adversely affected by this event, and it's been dramatic in that it happened all of a sudden. Right. So I was traveling. I was in India in um, late January, traveling back through. And I recall uh, people getting temperature checked on, at the airport at Gandhi International on the way out, people on flights from China. So I remember thinking to myself, hmm, that's interesting. I've not seen that before. And sure enough, you know, within another month or so, uh, the global economy was in the process of shutting down. So 
everyone has been affected in a sense. Many of you, I'm sure, are not at your places of work, normal work. This is the case for me as well. I'm, I'm not at the university today. I haven't been since middle of March. Um, and so it's also exposed systemic healthcare deficiencies, right? Um, and so that's another part to think about as well. Um, and the question has come up, um, which goal is very important uh, during the, uh, the pandemic? I think that's a really good question. And I would point to, uh, to these four, right? So if you're gonna create a kind of foundation for any kind of development in the world, it's got to begin with eradicating poverty and hunger, having good health and well-being, and promoting learning. Like those are baselines that every society must have and have in abundance. Um, and we know that those are challenging in and of themselves. So I would argue that, you know, in an era of COVID, those are the most significant. And I would also say that, um, you know, that the systematic problems within the healthcare industry, um, again, though nationally specific, have really come home to roost and exposed, have been exposed as a result, you know, of this crisis. So in terms of goal four, education, um, this has been a significant challenge. I want to talk about those challenges too. I'll say a bit about what the goal ensures, and that is, um, the, one of the key targets in the goal is ensuring gender equity. Um, that's a really important piece because as you know, girls are often left out of education when it is scarce. So they are either exited from school early um, or they never get the opportunity to go. And if you don't have gender equity, you can't have economic growth and development. So this is an important piece uh, to keep in mind. Um, so a lot of the goals and their targets engage in early childhood education equitably, as well as ensuring access for technical and post-secondary education for women um, and men, but for women, um, because this will both have the positive consequence um, of improving education across the board at the same time. Um, it will provide um, equitable access to the educational system. Now, again, this is, as you know, widely aspirational. This is not something we've achieved. But putting it in the top four, quality education, I think is really significant. Um, the other one is 4.7, which I didn't include in the target, but I think it's worth talking about for a moment. 4.7 says um, an access to quality education, which includes learning about sustainability and education. So this is an interesting kind of recursive dimension here, which is it's not just learning about, you know, or learning to be literate or to be able to work in mathematics, but rather it's also learning about the very goals themselves and learning about the movement of sustainability, right? So I think that's important. So it's not teaching kids to be tools of economic growth, but teaching them to engage the big issues that our global society is facing, among them economic growth. So in terms of disparate impacts, again, it's the same story, unfortunately, with COVID, which is the poor get poorer, um, the least equipped get even more, become even more vulnerable. And that's been exactly the case with education. And so we talk about in the United States, the academic achievement gap. So this is the achievement gap that exists between students of color and white and Asian students by and large. It breaks down that way, not always, but it breaks down that way. And it is the gap that exists between those that's most troubling to leaders because it's something that is, you know, sort of prima facie um, inequitable education, meaning certain kids are getting more opportunities than other kids and certain kids are achieving more than other kids and it is identifiable by race. Um, so this is um, a very significant problem before we ever had COVID. It's an even more significant problem now because after we've had this long period of kids not attending school, we've had an increase. Uh, we will experience an increase in the achievement gap um, as kids eventually return to school and have in many cases not had regular contact and interaction uh, with their school. So there has been an attempt to mount uh, distance learning very quickly. Um, in K-12 schools, um, those who had students who had a computer equipment at home, who had computer access at home, who had uh, internet or Wi-Fi access at home, made that transition fairly smoothly. Those that did not, did not. And so there is 
again, the gap was already there. The gap will be even more pronounced um, upon the return of regular school. So this is a real challenge, you know, moving forward. Um, the other piece I want to mention is that 90% of um, kids were not in school at the peak of the disease. That's very substantial, right? There's mil tens of millions of kids around the world that were not in school as a result, of, actually hundreds of millions of kids that were not in school as a result of this. Um, and as I said, the most vulnerable students, whether it's low performance academically, whether they're economically poor, um, if they're disabled, that's a whole nother set of challenges where no accommodations can be made at a distance. Um, they have been the most affected by the stay at home order. And the last piece I would put in, and this goes to the um, eradication of hunger, uh, we see this right in New York City. There was a real hesitation at the beginning of the pandemic to not close New York City schools. And they waited a, an additional week to close them. And the reason they did that was largely because of nutrition. So as ironic as that might seem, and among the wealthiest cities in the world, many of the 1.1 million kids do not have access to regular nutrition. And it is the schools that provide them that access. Um, in some cases, two or even three meals per day. And so the inability to have a way to achieve that um, without schools operating was a serious logistical problem. And I think it's one they largely resolved in actually implementing it. Um, I haven't tracked it beyond that, but it was one of the, the significant barriers to having um, to having a more uh, to having to closing school as a result um, of the pandemic. So, um, again, health impacts um, much the same. So, places of high vulnerability will show a disproportionate impact, and in this case, they've been economically disadvantaged areas. Although some, you know, very you know, wealthy cities like New Delhi, New York City, have had substantial challenges around the disproportionate impact. Um, rural areas, high density urban areas have been affected by this. Um, of course, we've all witnessed and heard about the shortages of critical equipment, including respirators, PPE, and test and trace capacity. The challenge that lies ahead is when we do have a vaccine, if we have a vaccine, I assume that we will, but that might not necessarily be the case, but assuming we have a vaccine, how will that vaccine be distributed? Um, in what sequence of timing? Who will get it first? Which countries will get it first? Um, I know this is a significant geopolitical challenge, right? And again, it points to the fact that we have a globally integrated economy, but not a globally integrated political system that measures that economy or that aggregates that economy. And so that is an ongoing challenge um, for the world to deal with. And it's, it's manifest in the healthcare system and we've seen it in particular take in relationship to, uh, to this challenge of COVID. So I wanted to um, leave some opportunity for conversation about how your institutions have responded to COVID. Like, what have you done? I'd be really interested to hear from, from you. Um, also, what do you think needs to be done in your institutions, institutions to provide support? And then lastly, what can educators do across sectors uh, to address the challenges uh, presented by COVID in the areas in which we work, mainly in the area of education, which I'm assuming most of you on the call are in that sector. So the mic is open. Uh, and maybe some of you can uh, take the mic, we can turn it over to you, and you can share with us what your institutions have done and what do you think needs to be done um, in your places as well? Like, what are the needs? Yeah, to Bujendra's question, um, the disparate impacts on schools. I don't know the answer. Um, we have it exactly the same problem um, in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania where I work. And that is certain schools are very well equipped and certain schools are not equipped at all. 
and some schools had continuous education, you know, beginning at the, uh, the period where the kids were sent home, others had none whatsoever. Um, and it took them a month, in some cases, six weeks to have any type of supplementary education. Uh, that's a significant challenge. And I think one is that there has to be an investment at the level of the government um, and the private sector uh, to equip those kids with the tools needed to learn. And that would be connectivity and some type of a device. Like that's a given. We, you, it's very difficult to imagine um, to learning at a distance short of that. Um, I mean, we could go back to a correspondence or radio-based course. That's a possibility. Um, but increasingly, this is the challenge of having the basic infrastructure and the hardware that's necessary to make that a reality. But that's a great question. You know, I, I think that's something we all have to focus on. And I want to end today, uh, when we get to the end, talking about the idea of resiliency. Like, I think that's really where we have to focus our efforts. Yeah. Nalini, good point, like restructuring the syllabus and recognizing that some of the work is going to occur outside of the classroom environment, right? So structuring it in such a way where students can learn um, in their daily life, you know, while practicing social distancing and not having the community of learners gathered in the same place, that's got to be, that's it's somehow got to migrate across sectors to get to get to that point, yes. Can others share with us how institutions have responded or what, what efforts they have made to try and address um, the learning challenges of COVID? Yes, Sarah, thank you. Um, so this is in the chat box if you're following. Yes, uh, Priyank, that's a great question. I, I don't know that it's it's hard to imagine like us surviving uh, economically as a result of this in the long term, um, short of effective treatments or vaccinations. Uh, that's a real challenge. Good question, Saurav. I mean, I think the next two quarters, there's, you're probably witnessing this, we are as well, which is there is fatigue around having the, um, the lockdown. There is a desire to um, restart the economy, and people are doing that um, while using social distancing, but in many cases, it's not working well. Um, I think we're likely to see regional spikes in the disease. We're starting to see that in the United States. Some 16 or 17 states are reporting spikes that are now from two weeks ago, which is uh, from the Memorial Day holiday where we had a holiday and people didn't practice social distancing as they had been. And so we're seeing a spike. So I think the next two quarters is likely to see a similar kind of, you know, spiking of the disease. Um, economically, I think you're going to see improvements in the short term. Um, I think there are going to be more people going back to work, uh, restarting of industries across the world, restarting of um, supply chains. I think that's underway. The question is, is it enough uh, to lift all boats? And, you know, what are the challenges moving forward in terms of distributing that wealth? Again, we go back to the kind of challenge of the SDGs, which is, we had inequality before this happened. We're going to have more inequality on the back end of it. So how are we going to redouble our efforts to a deal with inequality as a result, um, knowing that we're going to have more to deal with as a result of this challenge, of this, of this disease? Yeah, the, uh, the issue of tribal communities is a really interesting one. Um, I, I really don't know enough about that to say how to, how to work on achieving quality education in that regard. Um, I would imagine, you know, technology is off the table, but in rural areas, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and the extent to which it is, then you're going to have to use some kind of interim um, efforts 
Um, whether it's family-based or community-based efforts um, in smaller clusters, potentially. Um, but that's a great question. Yeah. Other questions or comments from the group uh, before we move ahead? So I wanted to share with you um, some of the webinars that uh, folks in the College of Education at Lehigh University have been engaged in uh, to give you a sense about what we're doing and the kind of work that we're doing. And um, these are all um, either they've happened and they're recorded or they are uh, so they're available to you. Um, or they are about to be recorded, and so they will be available to you. And so um, we had um, a session on youth under quarantine, tips for learning and caring. And the focus in this session was on uh, kids with uh, ADHD and the way in which um, parents can work with them as a result of COVID and having this extended periods of, of being at home together. And so that's one you might want to check out uh, by George DePaul, a professor in the College of Education. Um, uh, Chris Liang, the chair of our department, gave a talk called Helping Kids Caregivers and Teachers Cope. Uh, so a lot of it was around mental health issues and wellness. And uh, Chris, I believe, is also giving a similar seminar um, in the context of India, so you can attend that as well, though this one is also available by tape. Um, in the center here is uh, Farah Valera. Uh, Dr. Farah Valera gave a talk, or is giving a talk on online learning um, for immediate impact. And so her focus is on instructional design and curriculum development um, with the idea of having um, more access to uh, resources, materials, and courses and programs online, and how do we transition and pivot to that um, in a COVID era? Obviously, that's all been done on the fly, and so we have to do it in a way that's more uh, careful and judicious moving forward. Um, Brooke Sawyer here in the upper right. Um, Professor Sawyer gave a talk on motivating children to read during quarantine and beyond. Uh, really well received talk that about you know the basics of literacy and then how do we do literacy within the context of a quarantine. And then lastly, Professor Woodhouse gave a talk on social and emotional wellness for families during COVID. Obviously, that's a front and center concern. Um, and so this is, these are all recorded. Um, if they haven't been recorded already, they will be. And then we'll also have various um, opportunities for you to engage with these faculty members in their work. Um, what I've uh, appreciated about this, this moment is that it's helped to highlight and underscore um, the value of the work that people in the College of Education are doing to support families, to support students, to support um, communities as they grapple with how to deal with COVID. And so I think it's really put them front and center and I'm really um, happy that they've had this opportunity to share their work with a wider community of folks and I welcome you to engage with them um, as well. So I'm gonna check the chat one last time. Yeah, Parth's question about the meals, I think is a real, um, is a real problem. And uh, so we're gonna see an uptick in malnutrition as a result of COVID as well, uh, for sure. And so how do we create some kind of a structure that we get, you know, so that kids can eat at least on a regular basis, um, particularly in areas where food um, scarcity is a significant challenge. Yeah, Parth, great question about um, the connectivity um, and the use of TV as an alternative. Uh, we're doing the same in Pennsylvania. So there's an effort um, in Pennsylvania to um, provide public programming through TV that syncs up with the curriculum design for schools. And so that might be an option. Um, if you can reach me directly, I can put you in touch with the people who are doing that in Pennsylvania. 
Um, and there might be some crossover possibilities of sharing that information. Yeah, Naze's point about what about kids that um, are not going to benefit from working online? Um, and I think that's probably a substantial number. Some some kids will not work well online, and so the challenge will be how do you um, how do you compensate for the loss of time when they return. I think a lot of the work now will focus on that issue of resiliency. So how do you create resiliency within the school so that you can manage a crisis like this in the future, but then also how do you go back and compensate um, through you know, learning strategies or approaches that will allow students to do better um, once they do return to school. I think that's a, that's a significant area that we have to work on. So I think we're approaching the end of our time together. Um, I wanna thank you all for attending the session. And um, I wanna also point you to the resources uh, that Lehigh University has already offered with respect to the topics on the screen. And uh, know that we're doing this sort of in consolidation of or in cooperation with other institutions and with other community actors um, and with global partners. And we are um, looking forward to having partnerships with your institutions uh, once we get back to a place where we can uh, travel again and we can uh, offer courses and programming um, similar to this and in other areas that I've mentioned, uh, because I think it's really important that we, we keep the spirit of global cooperation alive, particularly um, in this time of pandemic. So I thank you all for coming. And I think Shashir has opened his mic or maybe it's Stacy, and I'll let sure. them take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Gautari. Thank you so much for your talk. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, you can reach out to me and most of you have my email address. Uh, if you don't have, it's uh, shu219 at uh, lehigh.edu. If you have any particular question, if you want to connect and uh, reach out to us, you're more than welcome to join us. And in fact, uh, Dr. Gaudeli has also shared his uh, email address in the, the slide. So you can uh, note it down or you can reach out to me directly and I will um, uh, pass the messages on. And um, if you would really want to know more about the College of Education, please feel free to reach out and uh, we will be able to answer the queries or if you want to con connect it with any particular professor or uh, in fact to Thanks, Stacey. Thanks a lot. If, so I wish yeah. you all a good evening. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Godelli. Thank you. Thank all. you everyone. Once again, peace.